All right, folks, we're going to get this going here. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the March webinar for the Lake States Fire Science Consortium. I'm Jack and Stinsky, and I'll be moderating the webinar this afternoon. The Lake States Fire Science Consortium is funded by the Joint Fire Science Program and is one of 15 regional consortia for fire science exchanges across the country. Our mission is to accelerate the awareness, understanding, adoption, and sharing of wild and fire science information by federal, tribal, state, local, and private stakeholders across the lake states and the adjacent Canadian provinces of Ontario and Manitoba. Let's take a brief look at our Adobe Connect webinar interface. To ask a question or interact with any of the other attendees, you can use the chat box that should be located in the lower right-hand portion of your screen. We'll be monitoring this uh, chat box for questions, and we'll make sure that there's an opportunity to address any of the questions. If you'd like to learn more about the consortium and what we are doing, please visit our website at lakestatesfireside.net. You can sign up to receive our newsletters and announcements of other activities at the site, too. Now on to today's webinar, Monitoring the Response of Moose to Large Fires in Minnesota. Mike Strage is the, or has been the wildlife biologist for the Fond du Lac Dam of Lake Superior Chippewa since 1995. In this capacity, he is expected to be the expert on everything from tribal treaty rights to moose biology to the proper care and handling of baby robins that have fallen out of the nest. Mike is a graduate of the University of Idaho and Virginia Tech and a resident of Duluth, Minnesota. So with that, let's get to the webinar. Take it away, Mike. Hi, folks. Um, thank you for this oppor opportunity to talk to all of you about uh, work we've been doing. Um, myself, uh, biologists from 1854 Treaty Authority, uh, as well as um, the Forest Service and Minnesota DNR. Uh, looking at the responses of moose to a uh, large fire in Minnesota. We'll just jump right into things here. Um, we look at our moose population trend in the last 20 or so years. Uh, we have maybe half the number of moose that we had 20 years ago. Um, the decline may be even steeper than that. Uh, we certainly did moose surveys prior to 2005. Uh, however, uh, changes in techniques and plot layout, uh, whatnot, uh, that happened in 2004 means the uh, to 2005 isn't directly comparable. Uh, but long and the short is we have half the number of moose that we did 20 years ago. Um, the last four or five years, perhaps, things have stabilized a bit uh, between three and 4,000 moose, um, but that certainly is no predictor of future trends. Um, so why is the decline happening? Uh, there's been a lot of research on this, um, some really good research conducted by the Minnesota DNR, as well as tribal agencies uh, looking at why this is happening. Um, leading cause is health issues. There are a number of them for moose. Uh, brain worm, which is a parasite normally carried by white-tailed deer, uh, is a big issue. There's also liver flukes, another parasite carried by white-tailed deer. And winter ticks, uh, which is a parasite that's fairly unique to moose, uh, and a variety of other health issues. Uh, but that's certainly a, a big cause of our moose decline. Um, predation. We have no shortage of wolves and bears in northern Minnesota, um, and they have an effect on moose. Uh, with adult moose, a lot of that predation is tied back to health issues that the moose have, uh, but also predation on, on calves is very heavy, particularly by wolves, but also by bears. Climate change. Um, we may be seeing issues with um, uh, heat stress on moose, and that indirectly then goes back to health issues. Moose become stressed out. They're more vulnerable to disease parasites. They also perhaps become more vulnerable to predation. Habitat decline is something I think we have not well considered um, as far as its role in our moose decline. And I believe we no longer have the amount of good moose habitat that we did 20 and 30 years ago. And that has also played a role in our moose decline. 
So moose and fire. Um, there's a lot of research that's been Please hold while I confirm your passcode. Thank you. Your passcode is confirmed. When you hear the tone, you will be the fourth person to join the meeting. All right, folks, I think we're back. Could people please type and let you know that you have audio? It looks like we're good. Apologize for that. I guess it wouldn't be a webinar without some technical difficulties. All right, so Mike, um, I believe you had just started getting into the major food, so take it away. All right, so I'll um, I'll just continue with this list that's up here. Uh, mountain ash, another food for moose in Minnesota, primarily in summer, and then also, of course, aquatic plants generally during the growing season. Uh, one thing that most of these species of, of food for moose have in common is they do really well in full sunlight. Um, full sunlight through fire logging other habitat disturbance. And moose being an 800, 800 or 1,000 pound animal that you know gets its nutrition from eating leaves and twigs, they need to eat a lot of food in order to meet their needs. So other habitat needs of moose, um, summer thermal cover. I don't know that we know a whole lot about what that looks like, but we believe that um, particularly on warm days, moose need some kind of summer thermal cover. It's probably tied to canopy closure and moist, moist soils. Um, at some level, moose need winter cover. It's perhaps not as important to moose in Minnesota as it is to say white-tailed deer, uh, but certainly it, at some level it would be important. Uh, and then hiding cover for uh, particularly for cows with calves in tow. And large fire. Uh, has good potential to provide a good juxtaposition of that food and cover. So moose can get under cover when they need to be and then step right out um, into areas of abundant forage and, and meet their nutritional needs. So I um, need to fill you folks in on uh, our, our moose population survey design, uh, which has some relevance uh, for, for the rest of this talk. Um, so bear with me here a bit. Um, we use a stratified random sample to estimate moose populations in Minnesota. Uh, in the past, we used three strata, low, medium, and high expected moose density. Uh, we have a total of 436 rectangular survey plots. Um, they were actually established in 2004. Um, we kind of messed up the 2004 survey, um, got a a uh, wildly inaccurate moose population estimate, so we sort of consider things as having started in 2005, but the plots were established in 2004. Uh, they are uh, two, two and two-thirds miles wide by five miles long, or roughly 8,500 acres in size. Uh, we fly eight east-west transects at a, a third of a mile intervals uh, uh, across the, each plot, 
we try for a consistent survey start in early January with at least eight inches of snow on the ground to improve visibility. Uh, some earlier research indicated that um, as you get further into winter, moose tuck under cover more and more. Uh, so trying to get a consistent start in January so our results are more comparable from one year to the next. We use two Minnesota DNR helicopters with two observers and a pilot on board. Um, prior to this habitat survey that I'll talk a little bit about, we were flying uh, 36 to 43 randomly selected survey plots each year, um, which amounts to less than 10% of the total of 436 plots um, that might get flown each year. So we were continually getting questions from colleagues, from the public, from the media, how are the moose doing in fill-in-the-blank large habitat disturbance? 1999 blowdown, a big fire, or a big logging job. And because we we're flying a random sample of plots and flying relatively few plots in any given year, our answer was usually, I don't know, because we haven't flown that area in a number of years. Or if we did happen to fly a disturbed area, it might not be the same plot from one year to the next if the disturbance covered multiple plots. And so it was very hard to make a comparison about what was going on from one year to the next. This just graphically um, kind of shows what I'm talking about. Uh, all the black rectangles are our moose survey plots. Uh, the yellow here is the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. And then I'll grab my grab my pointer here. Here's the uh, Pagami Creek fire area. And you can see even with a 92,000 acre fire, um, we only have seven or eight survey plots and only five of them entirely within the, the, the fire uh, and only a few more that overlap even a portion of the fire. So the odds of flying a Pagami Creek fire plot in any one year were pretty small and the odds of flying the same plot in consecutive years or even fairly close together in time were pretty small. So it was difficult to say if moose were responding to a big change in habitat. So this idea for a moose habitat survey was born. Um, and the idea here was, um, jump to the next slide. Um, we initiated this in January of 2012. Uh, and the idea was to understand moose responses to large habitat changes over time. This was a cooperative effort between the 1854 Treaty Authority, the US Forest Service, Superior National Forest, uh, the Fond du Lac Band, and the Minnesota DNR. The reasons for doing this was because managers need information for decision making. What kinds of moose habitat are we going to put on the ground? What works best? Where are we going to do it? The public wants to know. The public is paying our freight here. We all work for them. Um, they want to know how moose are responding to a fire, a logging job, something like that. Um, so I think we have a responsibility to try and get answers for them. Um, and in Minnesota, we're spending a few million dollars on moose habitat, and we should know where and how to best use that taxpayer money. So the idea was to um, fly the same survey plots every year for an extended period, and we said we want to do this for at least 20 years. We'll see what happens when we get to the end of 20. Um, and for some logistical reasons that I will talk about here in, in a minute, um, we had to piggyback this habitat survey onto existing moose population survey and utilize the same techniques and survey plots. So after consultations um, between uh, state, federal, and tribal biologists, uh, we selected three treatment types. Uh, wildfire was one. Prescribed burns was the other. And then timber management was our third treatment. Um, this is a fire sciences webinar, so I'm going to talk about wildfire and prescribed burns and ignore timber management for this one. But um, you can certainly ask me about that at the end. Uh, so we selected nine permanent habitat plots. 
um, three in each of these uh, three treatment types. So we have three wildfire, three prescribed burn, and three timber management plots. And then uh, to make our, our statistician happy, uh, we incorporated uh, this, we incorporated the results we got from these habitat plots, these permanent plots, into our population estimate as a fourth strata. Um, so now we have four strata, low, medium, and high moose density plus this permanent fourth strata um, from these nine plots. And all those numbers now can get fed into our final moose population estimate. Um, here's where our plots are laid out. Um, we're going to ignore today these three green ones, which are our, got to remember to grab my pointer here. Um, we're going to ignore these three green ones that are our timber management plots, and we're going to look at our prescribed burn plots here, here, and here, and then our three wildfire plots. So um, there are a number of shortcomings for this habitat survey. It's not the perfect design. There's many ways I would like to have been able to have done it better, um, and I'm probably have not listed all of our shortcomings on this. But um, so again, our survey technique and plot changes um, all came about in 2004, actually. Uh, we're no longer using fixed wing aircraft. We switched to helicopters. We're not using plots that are drawn on streams, lake shores, and roads. We're using rectangular plots. Uh, so a lot of the data is no longer directly comparable. Um, because we always have and continue to use a random selection of plots for our moose survey, the end result was on some of our permanent habitat plots where we're looking at treatments, landscape changes, um, we have little or in some cases no pretreatment data. Uh, we also have limited aircraft time and limited funds to fly them. Uh, we're always getting pushed by the deer survey people before we get done with the moose survey about when are the helicopters going to be available. There's a lot of demand on their time uh, and we don't have um, unlimited use of them. The population estimate retains priority. Um, it is very important to all these agencies that we have a accurate count of moose numbers or as accurate as possible. Um, so that was with our limited aircraft time and funding, the population estimate was the priority. As a result, this habitat survey is flown as part of the larger moose population um, survey estimate. It's not a standalone survey. Um, and our habitat treatments had to fit into the existing survey plots. That's kind of asked backwards maybe from the way we'd like to do things. Um, you know, you'd rather have your plots fit your treatments, um, but we had to do it reverse. Um, in some situations, we'd wind up, you know, it might be a 4,000 acre prescribed burn, but very little um, of the burn slopped into or the burn might slop into four or five different survey plots and not enough into any survey plot to where you could really be able to see if it was making a difference. Um, so that was one constraint on us, is searching around for um, treatments that fit a survey plot well. So we'll get into the results, um, look at the, the first of our um, prescribed burn plots that we fly. This is the Trout Lake burn uh, down here. Here's the Trout Lake burn outlined in red, Trout Lake. Um, this prescribed burn was set in September 2005. It totaled 10,000 acres in size. Uh, it was set primarily to reduce 1999 blowdown fuels. Across the plot, blowdown damage uh, from that July 4th windstorm uh, was considered light to severe. So this, in effect, means that this survey plot had two different treatments. Much of the timber blew down in 1999, and then a lot of it burned up in September 2005. Research done by Lee Freelich at the University of Minnesota indicates that when you 
blow stuff over and then later come along and burn it up, you really have an impact on the conifer regeneration. Um, usually works to reduce the amount of conifer that are gonna come back afterwards. Um, just eyeballing the regeneration from the helicopters at 300 feet and 50 miles an hour, um, the regeneration on this Trout Lake plot appears to be a mix of aspen, jack pine, spruce, brush, and on the rockier outcrops, um, even some oak coming back. If you look at where we are finding moose on the plot, um, each of these yellow dots is the um, location of a, a moose observation uh, between 2012 and 2017. Um, there might be one moose in each of these dots or four or five, or it's a cow-calf pair. Um, so it could be more than just one moose. But um, interestingly enough, um, you know, you can see the outlines of, of where the fire burned and the fire was all in here. Um, even though it's hard to tell from this aerial image where the fire stopped, the moose sure seemed to know where it stopped. And uh, most of our observations, almost all of our observations over the years looking at this plot, um, the moose are inside. Uh, and there's something about what happened inside that burn that moose like and are attracted to. If we look at the numerical results, um, this is why I talked about earlier about, gee, it had been nice to have had pretreatment data. Um, the fire was uh, set in 2005. Uh, we had one survey result, um, 2010. Uh, and then our survey started here in 2012. What I've graphed here, um, the red are the Trout Lake results. The green is the average of all our other high density moose plots. Um, so it's the Trout Lake plots compared to our best moose areas um, each year. And as you can see, the Trout Lake plot does pretty well as far as uh, producing moose as compared to our other good moose areas. Um, early on, it maybe underperformed the average a bit, but then in the last three years, it actually seems to be producing maybe a little better than average um, as far as our best moose areas. Um, I'd be really happy if all of our moose plots were producing 15 or more moose. Uh, so the Trout Lake does pretty well. Keck spider is our next prescribed burn. Um, this fire was lit in October 2010, uh, totaled just under 5,000 acres. Uh, the fire is listed or is here, um, kind of north central boundary waters. Here's the Canadian border right along this line. The intention was uh, to reduce fire or fuels again from the 1999 blowdown. Uh, blowdown damage across this plot was severe. This plot I, has particularly rugged topography, at least by Minnesota standards, it's rugged topography as compared to a lot of our moose range. And I think that has an impact um, on moose response. And again, eyeballing the regeneration as we fly these plots, it appears to have a strong conifer component. Uh, and I think the conifer component is perhaps related to the severity of the fire. Um, it probably just in most places was not that severe um, if it, between the blowdown and the fire, if it didn't replace the conifer, it tells me the fire wasn't a hot fire in many places. Um, I think be between the conifer component and the topography, it's having an impact on moose response here. Um, again, like with Trout Lake, um, here's our survey plot. Here's the fire. Um, this part of the, the plot has some of the, the most rugged topography, and I think that's why we don't see many moose over there. Um, however, again, most of the moose we're finding on this plot are within the burn unit. 
Again, looking numerically um, at the Keck spider results as compared to our other best moose areas, um, Keck spider kind of underperforms. Um, it's not bad, but uh, we have other moose areas that I think are a lot better. And I, I believe the reason it's not performing as well as other places, I think there's several. Uh, first of all, it's a relatively small fire less than 5,000 acres, and it's a fair piece from other good moose habitat. I think much of the moose habitat around Keck Spider is not great, so I don't think there's a ton of moose in the area to begin with. The fire is not that big or not big enough to draw moose in from other areas, and I think the rugged topography and the strong conifer component are also limiting um, the desirability of this fire to moose. It's not bad, but we have better. Uh, next prescribed burn is the Duncan Lake prescribed burn. This is a planned fire, hasn't happened yet. Um, fire or the burn is planned for just north of the Gunflint Trail. Gunflint Trail corridor is down here. Uh, we're into the boundary waters. Here's the Canadian border. Uh, the fire is proposed at a uh, little over 4,700 acres, uh, again designed as fuel reduction uh, for the uh, 1999 blowdown. This plot also has some rugged topography in it. Um, a mix of light to moderate blowdown as well as undamaged forest across the plot. Again, you know, we are finding moose there, um, generally within the area proposed to be burned. Numerically, as far as our results, um, Duncan Lake isn't too bad. Uh, in some years, it's, you know, it's, it's not the best moose country, um, but it, it isn't too bad in some years. Um, Duncan Lake is not very far away from, I think, moose habitat that is better, and I would really like to see it get burned. If anybody from the Superior National Forest is listening, we've got enough pretreatment data. You guys can go ahead and light it. Um, I really believe this is one area where uh, if we get a good burn here, moose will respond. Uh, I said it's it's not a far trek to some other good moose habitat, and I think moose will will be able to respond once this burn happens. All right, so now we're moving into my favorites, which is large wildfire. Um, first, we'll look at the Cavity Lake fire. Um, we call this the Cavity Lake plot. That's a bit of a misnomer. Um, here's the Cavity Lake fire area down here. Here's our plot. Uh, this plot also contains a uh, fair chunk of area from the Alpine Lake fire. Um, again, this survey plot, moderate to severe 1999 blowdown damage. Um, and then it caught fire. And we're going back here to the double whammy uh, blowdown plus fire. And in this case, I think it was fairly severe fire. Uh, and that impacts the regeneration. Um, first fire in August 2005 was the Alpine Lake fire at 1,300 acres. That's total fire size. The amount in the survey plot's a little smaller than that. Um, and then July 2006, the Cavity Lake fire at a total of 32,000 acres. Again, eyeballing the regeneration, uh, conifer regen is patchy. It's there. It hasn't been eliminated, but it's patchy. Um, there are still surviving patches of mature conifer and deciduous timber. Uh, I think there's also a fair amount of undamaged, unburned forest edge around the northern part of the, the survey plot uh, towards the perimeter of the Alpine fire and the northern edge of the Cavity fire. And I think that has an impact on on moose as well, providing some close proximity of cover. Um, a lot of brush and deciduous tree, birch, aspen regeneration coming up in the Cavity Lake fire. Um, 
you can see here moose really like this Alpine Lake Fire um, and certainly portions of the Cavity Lake Fire within our plot uh, is where moose want to be. Um, we look at numeric, numerically at the data. Um, we actually have one pretreatment survey of this plot uh, before the fire in 2005. Um, it wasn't bad. I think, I think this area was good moose country before the blowdown and before the fire. Um, you know, it wasn't fabulous, but wasn't bad. Then the fire in 2006, a year later, not much for moose on this plot. Um, we didn't survey the area here. We did one in 2010, and hey, look, there's moose coming back here, and it's already maybe doing a little better than some of our other good moose areas. By now, and during the course of our habitat, this cavity lake plot is consistently one of our best producer of moose numbers. It always ranks well up there in terms of, of a good moose plot. Uh, I think moose have really responded here. And I think that's a combination of blowdown plus fire, uh, and it's just provided a really good mix of cover and forage. Ham Lake Fire is the next one I'll talk about. Um, this Ham Lake plot is right kind of kitty corner to our cavity plot. Here's our cavity plot here. Here's our Ham Lake plot. Um, like our cavity plot, there's actually another fire sneaking in here. Uh, the Roy Lake fire is over here. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, here is the Gunflint Trail corridor. And then over here is Canada. Uh, so 1976 Roy Lake fire impacts uh, kind of the western quarter or so of the plot. Um, the Gunflint Trail corridor with the, the highway, campground, and, and some housing development, I think, also impacts what we see and where we see moose here. Um, much of the plot, particularly the eastern two-thirds of the plot, suffered light to severe blowdown damage in 1999. Um, the Ham Lake fire itself in 2007, 75,000 acres, most of that burned in Canada. Um, but quite a lot on the U.S. side as well. Um, what we're seeing for regeneration is abundant brush and deciduous tree regeneration coming up there. And the conifer swamps appear to be largely intact on this survey plot. Um, you know, it looks to me uh, the fire just skipped them, and that provides a good mix of cover and forage for moose in this area. We look at where we're seeing moose on the plot. Um, you know, here's the Roy Lake fire, and then this area here didn't burn. And so what we have over here is maturing jack pine, and moose don't want to be there. Uh, this area here, I think, is impacted because we have a highway. Uh, we have a number of seasonal and maybe even some permanent homes in here. Um, and so moose seem to avoid this area a bit. Uh, but once you get over towards the boundary waters and then into the boundary waters, that's where the moose want to be. And I think it's a very good mix of cover and forage uh, that's been provided by the, you know, one-two punch of the, the blowdown and the fire. Uh, again, if we look at numerical response, um, one pre-survey or uh, pre-treatment survey plot, Nothing impressive as far as um, moose numbers on the plot in 2005, um, Ham Lake fire in 2007. And since then, Ham Lake, like the Cavity Lake fire, has been consistently among our best producers of moose. And um, yeah, it regularly outperforms our other good moose plots. Pagami Creek fire, um, there's the fire, there's our survey plot. Um, much of this area in here was actually logged uh, between 1949 and 1965 uh, prior to the creation of the Boundary Waters. And so I think what we had pre-fire was a lot of maturing second growth forest. 
Um, the Pagami, particularly our survey plot, but I think much of the uh, Pagami fire area suffered uh, little or no blowdown damage in 1999. Um, so, in effect, this survey plot has just a single treatment, just the Pagami Creek fire, no blowdown to complicate things. Uh, the Pagami Creek fire, it actually started in August, um, but got really exciting in September of 2011. On our survey plot, it impacted all of the plot except for about 200 acres. Um, the really big blow up in Pagami was the afternoon of September 12th and burned uh, primarily this area of the fire. Our survey plot uh, burned primarily on September 11th and the morning of September 12th is pretty much what consumed all of our survey plot. I think looking at things that was plenty hot enough uh, during the 11th and the morning of the 12th but not the super bad stuff that blew up on the afternoon of the 12th. Um, again, flying this survey plot, flying much of the Pagami Creek fire, that fire burned very thoroughly, I, right through those conifer swamps that uh, the Ham Lake fire seemed to have skipped. Um, so the regeneration, and I think this again related to that single treatment, just fire, uh, the regeneration is a mix of large patches of jack pine um, intermingled with large patches of deciduous regeneration, brush and probably aspen and birch coming back. And I think that is and is going to, um, in the future, impact um, the moose response to uh, the Pagami Creek fire. So here's where we're seeing moose on the fire. Um, kind of scattered around. I, I'm not sure I really see any patterns. Um, here's the unburned portion right here in the corner. Um, if we look numerically, uh, we had one pre-fire survey. Um, nothing at all impressive about that moose uh, number there. In fact, I think that whole general area was poor moose habitat. Um, Pagami Creek fire in uh, 2011. Um, January 20, 2012, we started this survey. I think this moose was lost. Um, it was the only moose we saw in, the, um, in that survey plot that year. Um, and the only moose we would see in the survey plot for the next three years. Uh, in fact, flying over the Pagami Creek fire, uh, which we do a lot, at altitude when we're transiting between Ely and Grand Marais and various survey plots um, uh, throughout moose range during during our moose counts. Um, there were just no moose there. I think it burned so severely and took away so much cover that, that moose just weren't there. Uh, in fact, it was harder than an otter track. Um, they were just not there. And then in 2016, it was like somebody flipped the switch. Um, and the vegetation had responded enough, and moose discovered it. And 2016, we counted 10 moose there. And that trend has continued the last two years. Um, not outstanding moose numbers, but pretty good moose numbers. Uh, I think, you know, Pagami Creek, my suspicion is because of the amount of conifer regeneration in Pagami, uh, as compared to, say, cavity and ham, which I think have a much larger component of deciduous regeneration, as well as cover and food, I don't think Pagami is ever going to produce moose as well as cavity and ham do. Even if it's pretty good, I don't think it'll be as good. And I think the improvement in moose numbers will not last as long in the Pagami Creek area um, once that conifer starts to mature uh, as it is in the cavity and ham lake fire areas. I think the moose response will last longer in cavity and ham than it will in Pagami. Anecdotally, um, as you know, we fly other fire areas from time to time. 
um, in the course of our survey. Uh, this picture was taken over the 1995 uh, Windchill Lake fire. Uh, there's actually, I think, one, two, three, four, five moose in this picture. Um, moose are finding these burn areas, and uh, I think, you know, painting with a broad brush, they they respond well to them. They like to be there. There's something about these areas that makes a moose want to be there. Other metrics to consider, though, um, with this survey, um, we, we might be seeing lots of moose on these plots, um, but does that really mean there are more moose out there? Um, or are we simply pulling moose from uh, poorer habitat into the supposedly better habitat of these burn areas? Uh, and I can't say for sure what we're doing. Uh, my gut feeling is we're doing something good for moose with these fires. And there's certainly a lot of other research that shows that. Um, one key measurement is not just that you have more moose, but is moose survival and reproduction improved because of what you've done? Uh, and we don't know. Uh, all of the moose research that's been conducted so far has been done outside of the boundary waters. Uh, we have had a couple of animals, um, you know, by chance wander into burn areas and whatnot, collared animals. Uh, but we really have no measurement of uh, survival and reproduction of moose with access to big burns versus moose that don't. And that would be a key metric for knowing, you know, how much benefit a large fire is having to a, a moose population. Um, you know, we're doing our survey in January. Um, where are moose at other times of the year? I don't know for sure. Um, but I suspect, based on anecdotal information, that if moose are using a fire area in January, they're still there in July. Uh, anecdotally, you know, back in the day when Minnesota still had a moose hunt, um, hunters going into the Cavity Lake Burn were not having any problems seeing a lot of moose in the Cavity Lake Burn in October. Uh, and they were certainly still there in January. Um, the radio telemetry work we've done with moose over the years, uh, we don't have a migratory population of moose. There's no evidence that moose are moving to burns in January and then moving somewhere else at a different time of year. You know, moose establish a home range and tend to stick in that home range year round. The other thing that would be nice to have to go along with this uh, moose survey, this habitat survey, uh, would be a, a corresponding vegetation survey um, so that we could try and tie what we're seeing with moose numbers um, to changes in vegetation within these areas. There are certainly vegetation monitoring plots out there, um, but they were set up for their own purposes and they um, don't always work well um, for trying to understand what's going on with the vegetation in our in our uh, moose survey plots. So um, are we making uh, much difference with all these fires? Um, so the blue line is our moose population trend. Here's all those fires I just talked about. There's been other fires too, uh, just back of the envelope, you know, within Minnesota since 2005, something like 200,000 acres burned uh, within moose range. That still only amounts to about 5% of moose range uh, that's been burned since 2005. Um, so I think one of the problems is we're not doing enough habitat work to really affect moose. Um, but I think it's also fair to say that habitat is not the only problem that our moose populations are facing. Um, there's health issues, there, there's predation issues. Um, and I firmly believe, as do others, that we are not going to turn our moose numbers around if we only address one thing, and that we need to work on moose on multiple fronts if we're going to um, change the way this trend line has been going. So um, if you uh, want to know what I think about moose and fire recommendations, um, you know, here they are. Uh, I think fire is good for moose in most cases. You know, certainly the results of what we're seeing with this survey, um, as well as a whole lot of other literature says most of the time, in most cases, fire is good for moose. Um, fire creates abundant forage. 
Moose need to eat a lot. Uh, so fire is good for moose that way. Most fires, um, the way they burn, you know, varying severity, uh, provides an excellent juxtaposition of cover and forage for, for moose. Um, I think something that has not been well studied, but um, is, I suspect is true, is that fire plays a role in reducing or eliminating parasites or parasite hosts that are causing some of the health issues that our moose herd has. Um, for example, fires between May and September are going to burn up all the winter ticks, eggs, and larvae that are on the ground at that time of year. Um, and that has health benefits for moose. Um, fires during the growing season are also, I believe, likely to take out the snail host that is the intermediate host for the brainworm parasite between white-tailed deer and moose. If you don't have that snail, white-tailed deer cannot give moose brainworm. And I think fire potentially could help reduce snail populations. And I think if you reduce snail populations, it would take a long time for them to recover. So I think we need to let wildfire burn and aggressively use more prescribed fire. I know we talk about this a lot. Um, but in practice, I don't think we do it very well. We're still very cautious about using fire, too cautious, I think. If you're going to do something for moose, go big, go hot, or go home. Um, I'm be I know I'm being a little bit flip with that remark, but um, really I, I think um, what we're seeing with this habitat survey is big fire is better than small fire. Um, hot fire with varying degrees of severity is better than a low intensity fire. Um, and even better, if you can burn it once, come back in five or 10 years and burn part of it again. And I think you would see a positive moose response there for many years to come. All right, so here's a nice picture of a cow with two uh, calves in tow in the Ham Lake fire. And that's all I have if there's questions. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, we do have a couple questions already, and I, I want to remind folks um, the questions in the chat box. Um, Mike, do you can you see the chat box, or do you want me to read the questions? Um, yeah, I can see them. Um, so the first one is from Wolfgar, and he's asking um, about old moose survey data from Trout Lake, uh, 1980s, 1990s, he calls. Yeah, I think there, you know, we, we've got moose survey data. Um, the Forest Service did some stuff and, and the DNR did some stuff. I mean, all the way back, maybe even into the 70s. Um, the problem is much of that is on paper data sheets somewhere in, you know, a dusty file room somewhere. Um, and even if I could get access to it and had the time to go through it, um, a lot of that information is not directly comparable to the survey results we get now. You know, back, back in the 80s and 90s, it was fixed wing aircraft, and the plots were not the same size and shape as they are now, um, irregular in size and shape. And so making direct comparisons would be hard. Um, question about timber management treatments. Um, well, um, I didn't do as much work with the data on the timber management getting ready for this talk as I did with fire. Um, you know, it's certainly up there in that Grand Portage country, uh, we're looking at uh, some of the, um, the vegetation management areas, uh, particularly the lima green area that the Forest Service is working on, uh, where they're doing a number of uh, different t timber treatments, uh, mostly cutting related, to see how moose respond to that. Um, I, I don't know that I have um, a really good answer uh, for Matt, um, you know, but I, I think it's timber management and not just the cutting of timber, but also what you plant afterwards or allow to regenerate afterwards um, certainly is going to impact moose. Uh, certainly, I think when there was more logging and larger units, um, in general, it would have been better moose habitat, and we had higher moose numbers back in the day. And I think, you know, outside the boundary waters, 
we're not willingly going to let large fires burn. Uh, and so we need to replicate fire with timber harvest if, if we want to improve moose numbers outside of the boundary waters. Um, Wolfgar's question about uh, are moose less susceptible to predation in burn areas? Um, I'm sure that uh, if I dug into the literature, uh, I could get at some of those answers. Um, boy, I don't know, uh, Wolfgar. I mean, we've flown the Cavity Lake plot and, and uh, seen a wolf pack of 11 animals up there. Um, I think they figure out how to get around in that stuff. Um, they're certainly not gone. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's generally believed that cow moose with calves uh, will not go out into the big open areas as far from the, the forest edge as, say, a mature bull will. And that's probably related to risk of predation. Um, you know, but are moose more or less susceptible to predation burn areas? I, I guess I don't know. All right, we got a few more people typing here. But there's a, Mike, while we're waiting, um, I'm curious, what, so what are the next steps for the survey? Are you going to continue as is, or? Um, yeah, so we, um, we, we've managed to, to score um, some BIA funding, um, which should allow us to continue this survey for the next dozen or more years. Uh, you know, it's, I think as it's been going along, um, you know, staff and is appreciates being able to look at some of these areas consistently, and it is not negatively impacted the the population estimate. It's probably added to it. It's not proven to be a big drag on time or resources, which was one of our objectives and one of our constraints in setting up this survey. So. Yeah, I anticipate as, as long as we can continue to have a moose survey, um, we will continue flying these habitat plots for the foreseeable future. Now, would we consider changing out some of these plots over time? Um, I think we, we certainly would consider doing that, yeah. All right. Um, let's see, we have a Follow-up question from Matt asking, do you have any data or observations about the moose habitat? Any to Finland? Uh, no, I do not. Okay. <laughs> and if, uh, if, 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 you know, again, again, that may be just, um, I'm assuming he's talking about a, a um, you know, a, some hand, landscape or habitat work they're doing there. Uh, and you know, I'm not saying it's it's a it might be a very good project, and it may be that moose are responding. Um, however, we we just that goes back to the random nature of this survey is you know we just don't fly that country very much. So if I knew exactly where uh, where Matt was talking about it, we could probably look up and see if we've flown that area and if we were seeing moose um, in that area. All right, it, it's looking like Matt might be typing. Hopefully. Um, Give me a little more detail. Um, while he's doing that, let's see, Pete asked a question, based on your surveys, do you think that linear feature density has a negative impact on moose population numbers? Uh, I'm not sure what he means by linear feature density. All right, well, Pete, if you, uh, if you could also <laughs> type a little more clarification. We've got a few more people typing. We'll we can get some more. Clarified here. All right, Pete's asking road. Let's see, roads and transmission lines mainly. Hmm. Um. You know, I I have never never gotten the sense that. Um, you know, just their, the existence of roads and transmission lines is negatively impacting moose. Uh, you know, certainly you get to a certain density of roads and transmission lines, and that can be 
negative, uh, you know, if, if predators are using them as travel corridors, if there's too much human-related disturbance, that can be an issue. But, um, yeah, I, I, I guess I've not felt um, that, you know, the amount of transmission lines and roads on, on the Minnesota landscape today is, is having much of a negative impact on our moose numbers. All right. Um, let's see, and Matt, clarify a little bit. Um, let's see, regarding the uh, Moose Habitat Management Project north of Finland, Minnesota, he said it's a Deer Hunters Association, Lake County Collaborative Project funded by LCCMR uh, in between Finland and Isabella to the east of Highway 1 near Murphy City area. Right. Um, so, uh, no, I guess I don't have any specific information about that. I know there are uh, organizations, NRI, um, 1854 Treaty Authority, um, has been going into some of these um, particular project areas and measuring vegetation response uh, and, you know, uh, tallying species and then whether or not moose are in the area. Um, but from the standpoint of our aerial survey, most of these habitat collaborative projects are they're very small areas, you know, small as in a couple hundred acres or smaller, scattered here and there. And with the kind of aerial survey we're doing, I don't think we could pick up whether or not it's benefiting moose. Um, I think we need to stay focused on our our large, you know, thousand acre habitat changes. Um, to w just at the scale we're working, we wouldn't be able to. I think accurately identify whether a, a small change is having an impact or not. All right. Well, let's see. I'm not seeing any more questions. I don't think we've missed any, and then we have a few more people well, typing. See so. A couple more typing. Yep. Yeah. So let's give a few minutes here. See if we have additional questions. Um, Tom McCann, can you see his uh, question there, Mike? Yeah, uh, I'm just reading through it. You know, I yeah, um, certainly if, if I wanted to improve the habitat on Isle Royal, I would certainly look at using fire. Um, Isle Royal is a unique case in some instances. Uh, you know, there was a large fire over part of that island back in the 1930s, and moose densities on Isle Royal, uh, from what I understand, in places are high enough that they actually, through their browsing, maintain the brush communities um, that grew up after that fire. Uh, and, you know, that's, we don't have the kind of moose densities and browse pressure on the mainland uh, to where that could happen. Uh, so I think Isle Royale is a little bit unique be just because of the moose density. Um, and I think right now in the absence of wolves or the near absence of wolves, um, you know, probably the last thing we need to be doing on Isle Royale is things to increase moose numbers right now. You know, but I, again, it's National Park Service land. It's you know, miles out in Lake Superior, and, and so I, you know, I'd strongly advocate if lightning happens on Isle Royal, let it go, see what happens. Okay. Thought somebody else was typing, so we'll give just a few more minutes here. I'll see if there's other questions coming up. And, and Isle Royal would be potentially a really good laboratory because of the intensity of their their research there um, to look at things like, you know, if you have moose on an undisturbed portion of the island versus a disturbed portion, um, you know, are those moose on the disturbed landscape surviving better and, re and producing more calves um, than moose in the undisturbed landscape? Yeah, big, good outdoor lab. <laughs> All right. Well, again, folks, if there's more questions, please type them in. Um, I'm going to kind of start wrapping this up, but we do have time for questions if there's any more. Um, our 
April webinar uh, has kind of been postponed. We're not sure um, if we'll be having an April webinar yet. Um, we do have an added webinar. It's May 1st. It'll be uh, presenting new information on land fire in the lake states. Um, that has not even been put on our website or announced, but we'll be getting that announcement out pretty soon here. Um, and without any more questions, we can wrap this up. So, Mike, there's Jeff, you want if to I could. Oh, sure. Yeah, Jack, if I could just jump in for a second. Um, I, I forgot to mention this earlier. I do produce an annual report on this survey. Um, I haven't gotten around to the 2018 report yet, but um, if folks are interested in receiving that annual report, there's my contact information. Uh, give me a phone call, shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to add you to the list to, to get a copy of the report. Um, if you're interested in past reports, they're also available on, on uh, the Fond du Lac Resource Management Division website. That's good information. Yeah, Mike, um, actually, if you could um, provide me with that information, I could add this to the uh, webinar archive page um, for this webinar so that there's additional information. So people are looking at the archive webinar recording. They also have access to any of the past reports. That's good. All right. I can certainly right. do that. I appreciate that. Good. OK. Um, well, yeah, we'll wrap this up then. And, and Mike, thank you so, so much for uh, doing this. Uh, thank everyone online for joining us this afternoon. I apologize for that little uh, audio um, mix up there, but I'll try to get that cleaned out of the recording. Um, if you'd like to review the webinar, share this with somebody. Um, I'll be getting a recording of the webinar available on the Lake States Fire Science Consortium website. I intend to do that later this afternoon. And with that, I'd like to thank you again, Mike, and everyone for participating. And Mike, if you could just hang on as we close this out, that'd be great. For everybody else, have a great rest of your day. Thanks.